Hello, boys and girls. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And today, we are going to be predicting the standings and doing roster rundowns on the Atlantic Division. We just did the Metro Division, and everybody in the land enjoyed that so much. Figured I'd do the Atlantic as well. Pretty simple. I'm going to predict what place I think each team will be in. Atlantic is a difficult one, for sure. And I'm going to give a rundown as to why I think so. And you are going to subscribe to the channel and comment in the comment section. Tell me what your placement is for each team, why you think, if you agree with me, disagree with me. It's all good. Uh, just comment there and tell me tell me what you think. This is all part of the Steel Flyers All Sports Network, where we're going to be getting some swag. Perlo swag. Woo. Good times. And you'll be able to go there and pick that up. And also, you can listen to Hockey Writers Inc. over there. Fantastic. Lance and Steel do a great job over there. Check it out. Okay. Also, if you want to, I'll be doing live streams with Jot the Wall John and uh, Peyton on the radio. All of that. So, let's get into who I think is going to be last place in the division. We're going to go from last to first. Hit it. There we go. And I don't think this is much of a surprise here, is it? The Montreal Canadiens are last place. Yeah, I do believe that Montreal will probably have more of an effort this year than they did last year. Um, things were... Kind of a disaster until St. Louis got in there. But overall, you just look at this roster. What are you going to do, man? Caulfield, Suzuki, Anderson on the top line is solid. I mean, Suzuki's still a young guy. Uh, plenty of upside. Caulfield, everybody is waiting for him <coughs> to go off. And he may. Josh Anderson is what he is. He's actually better defensively than I gave him credit for to start out with. So, I mean, that's not a bad top line. We don't know what Slopkowski is going to be. Christian Dvorak is pretty much what he is, a decent two-way guy. Puts up some offense. Is Brendan Gallagher going to keep on holding up? He looks like he's sort of fading already at 30 years old. Sean Monaghan hasn't had a good year in a long time. Kirby Doc, I love the move, but what's he going to be after coming from Chicago? He struggled heavily last year. Uh, Mike Hoffman, poop, poop player, really. And then, you know, they it's good they got the Donuff on the fourth line. That's probably where he belongs. But overall, this roster is is just not good enough. It's just not good enough. And it's kind of a good thing that it's not good enough because – Draft picks are what this team should be looking for, right? Uh, as far as defense is concerned, Jordan Harris showed some promise, but there's no way he should be anyone's top left D. No one. Uh, neither should David Savard anymore at this stage of his career. Arbor, please tell me. I just noticed that. I think it's Zakai. I think it's Zakai. That... I didn't even know who he was. I had to check it out. And now he's going to be playing in your top four. Chris Weidman shouldn't be a top four. I mean, they picked up uh, Kovacevic from Winnipeg. He couldn't make Winnipeg. Winnipeg's got a bad defense. And now he makes this roster? I don't know, man. This is a sad-looking roster. And I can't say it any more than that. Jake Allen isn't a number one anymore. Samuel Maltenbowl isn't a number one. Droan scratched. I don't know if that is going to be the case down the stretch, but, I mean, his career just keeps on going more and more downhill all the time. Uh, would be better if, my, if Math, when Matheson comes back. It's only day-to-day, -day, so he probably will be taking that spot there, which makes it look a little better, but honestly, not, not that much. Edmondson is indefinitely out. I mean... I don't know what more to say. Tell me where to find the positives here, uh, except that they got a lot of young guys now that are working their way up that should be good eventually. I was surprised to see Justin Barron sent down. I thought he would get a really good shot 
at a spot, but I guess they figure you know, he's only 20 years old. Probably is best to get top, you know, top pairing minutes down in the AHL, build himself up. Corey Schooneman looked like he could have got a kept a roster spot, and he got sent down as well. So I got to put him last place. I guess the biggest question is, is it last place in the league? Unfortunately, no. I don't think so. Chicago pretty much will have that wrapped up. Arizona might be able to be there. And Philadelphia, I think Montreal might be better than all of them, which is not good. But still, top draft pick for them this year. I can't see them going anywhere. Can't see things working out in any way, shape, or form as being close to a playoff spot in this Atlantic division where, as we see, things are getting tougher and tougher all the time. Because my next team is the Ottawa Senators, and I don't like it. Like, it just doesn't feel right after all the good work they did in the regular season to put them in the seventh spot here. Um, Brady Kachuk, Norris, Batherson, like the top six here is really good. Debrinkat is a fantastic, amazing player. He was the straw that was stirring the drink in Chicago. Not Kane, not Taves. It was Debrinkat last year that gave them any success whatsoever on their forward group. Uh, and now he comes over, and I'm sure he's going to crush. Tim Stutzel is probably going to, you know, step it up this year. Like their top six unarguably has got to be fantastic with Claude Giroux there as well. Um, I, I also like their third line, Mott, Pinto, Joseph. And I don't, the fourth line is not too shabby. Kelly Castellic Kis, made it in, really, eh, with Watson. So you're like, okay, well, how could you possibly put them seventh in the division? And honestly, I could see all the teams that I'm going to do now all the way up until the playoff spot, I think you could kind of mix and match here. It's really just, uh, not threading the needle. What's the term I'm looking for? I can't remember. But I only do these once. I no, I only do these videos one time, no editing. If it doesn't come to me, it doesn't come to me. How come I, okay. It doesn't matter. It's close. Let's just say that. Uh, so it's the defense. I do like Zub. I think he's good. I don't know if I'd want him top pair. I've heard nothing but good things about Sanderson, but he's only 20 years old. So we'll have to. I'll have to see it with my own eyes in the NHL. A 20-year-old rock in the top four and being able to do it over an 82-game season to believe it. Okay. Uh, it just doesn't happen often enough. I hear Jake Sanderson is one that could it could be. But the problem is after that, Travis Hamannuk is not a top four defenseman. Eric Brandstrom, I like the way he improved last year. Uh, he could possibly improve more. I could see him improving more. And, you know, that's not bad. But Nikita Zaitsev is everybody knows he's not very good. Splitting hairs. That's what I'm trying. That was the term I was looking for. From this spot to the playoffs, we're really splitting hairs with all these teams, which is a term that means it's really close to who can be in what spot. But I'm putting Ottawa down because I'm not huge on their defense. Ottawa also doesn't have the cap space to improve like some of the other teams we're going to talk about. So that's a little bit concerning. And, you know, Talbot's out for the first little while. I really think Anton Forsberg is going to take this number one spot from him anyways. But Magnus Halberg really hasn't solidified himself at 31 years old as a solid, as a worthy NHL goaltender as of yet. And he's 31 years old already. So that can be a bit of a problem. One thing I do think Ottawa's got going for them is if injuries arise, they have some pretty good replacement players. And Chase Horlock, really, Greg probably wasn't too far away uh, to making the team. 
And, you know, they just signed Broussard. Dylan Gambrell can play. Nick Holden on defense isn't bad. Uh, you know, J- J- Bernard Docker, I was actually kind of surprised he didn't make it. Same as Lassie Thompson. I think they have good depth that way, which bodes well, which makes me wonder if I shouldn't be putting them higher. But I still just I don't know if the defense is going to be good enough. And last year, the overall team defense was a struggle. And it's got to come up a lot, I think, to be really, truly effective. I love their compete. I love their heart. I love any team with a Kachuk on it. I'm not anti-Ottawa at all. I think they're really, really close. And it wouldn't surprise me at all when you got Shane Pinto and Matthew Joseph on your third line that they show me wrong here and even make the playoffs. But I could say the same about just about every team I'm going to talk about right now. Tell me what you think, Ottawa Senators fans, or anyone out there. What do you think about Ottawa? Do you think I, uh, I'm giving them, uh, selling them short here? Or am I getting pretty accurate to where they may land this year? Next, in the sixth spot, the Boston Bruins. Yes, that's right. This doesn't feel right even to me to say. It does sound like Taylor Hall is going to make, make it and be in the lineup for the start of the season, which certainly bodes well. And the it's tough to say this because you bring back David Krejci. Honestly, David Krejci didn't have a great year last year. I know he looked good in preseason. It's really easy to look good in preseason, okay? A lot of people are trying. You're up against people that shouldn't even be in the league. You can make wonderful little moves and make yourself look good in the preseason. Uh, now I'm not putting them down for that. Pasternak and Krejci are really trying to work hard to get themselves back into, uh, back into, uh, game shape with each other and get that chemistry back. So, but it doesn't impress me. It doesn't tell me, oh, this is back to where it needs to be. Uh, but the Zaka Krejci Pasternak line so far has looked good. We'll see how that turns out. My gut says it's going to be good. Just like Ottawa, you look at the top six here with Hall, Bergeron, and DeBrusque, it's not bad. But without Marchand, kind of like there, and uh, without Marchand, this lineup doesn't look great. Now, A.J. Greer made the team. I think that's great for A.J. Greer. There's not too many guys that have worked harder to get themselves into the NHL than A.J. Greer. His skating has been an issue. Well, I don't know how much of an issue it is now. I got to see him in NHL. But man, it had to come a long way. My gut tells me that it's still an issue. And you're playing him with Charlie Coyle and Smith. It's an okay third line. Not great. Nick Felino playing fourth line with Noshik and Lauko. Okay, whatever. It's, it's okay. It doesn't blow my mind. There's teams out there that certainly that we're looking in the Atlantic division that are much better. Their depth still hasn't really improved until Marshawn comes back into the mix. And then, you know, these lineups start to look a lot better. But Marshawn is a huge loss. He's saying that he's going to be back at the end of November. I don't know. We'll see. And then now, of course, the other big problem, both McAvoy and Grizzlick are out. And how long are they out? Like months, right? Six months. Month to month for Grizzly. Who knows when he's going to be back. And this is why I have them down here. This is tough. I, I mean, it's hard to put a Boston team that competes like Boston always does. Uh, there's just an aura with Boston. They will never back down. I love their game. But Lindholm and Carlo, Carlo had a horrid season last year. He needs a bounce back year. Is he going to have a bounce back year? I can't really rely on that. Mike Riley and Connor Clifton, Connor, like, that is not a good 3-4, really. And four birds to borrow, forget about it. It's the defense here that is just not good enough. Not for the improvements in this division. It's just not good enough. They, hopefully they can keep themselves in it. Marshawn and McAvoy comes back. Hopefully Grizzlick as well. 
and they can make a run and they you know they, they may do that because they're Boston but I can't with the improvements of the other teams I, I just can't rightfully put them up there I love Jeremy Swayman there's another one Swayman at 23 years old he could just go off 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 here you know, Swayman could do things that, like, Shesterkin is doing for the Rangers this year. And if that's the case, this team probably does make it in. And like I said with Ottawa, we're splitting hairs here between eight and four, really. It's going to be freaking tight, I think. But I'm putting them down there just simply because of all these obstacles and question marks that are in this lineup right now. Tell me if you think I'm being a little hard on Boston here with this lineup, Bruins fans, or if, uh, you know, and, and there's a coaching change to go with here as well, right? So there's a, something else they have to adapt to early. It's a lot to adapt to early here. A lot of players playing with each other that normally didn't play with each other and all that kind of stuff like that. And if they get too far down, it just might be too much for them to get it back. So, all right, Boston fans, tell me what you think about that. If I'm missing out, on, missing anything, let me know in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel and let me know. Detroit Red Wings are my fifth spot. And this and the next team are like a coin flip. It's all split in hairs and this one's really tight. Uh, here's the reason why I put Detroit out of the playoffs. Or, well, first, why I think they could make the playoffs. Let's start with that. Bertuzzi, Larkin, Raymond, that line is insane. I think Larkin's going to have an amazing year this year. I think Bertuzzi's going to have an amazing I think that line is going to be one of could be one of the best in the league. I really love Lucas Raymond is incredible. Uh, Perron, Kopp, and Verana. There's nothing wrong with that for a second line. A one-shot shooter like Perron. Andrew Kopp can play it all ways. Like, there's two really... And the speed of Verana. The only thing I can say with this is this is going to be a drive-to-the-net type line. Creativity isn't going to be the way here for this line. This is like get in the spots and shoot, get in the spots and shoot. Nothing wrong with that. Tends to lead to injuries, though. A line like this because you have to score by run into the net a lot uh, and Jacob Verana has already had his difficulties with injuries however if that being the case I still say this line scores quite a bit uh, I think that it is a solid second line nice contrast to a super skilled first line, although Bertuzzi has that jam that you love to see in a player to go along with his skill as well. But it's good so far. I'm really interested in seeing how Elmer Soderblom works. Seems like he's made the team over Philip Zadina. That's scary. This was a huge offseason for Zadina to come in and do some damage. Maybe he will be in the... He'll make it into the opening roster. I don't know. But usually when preseason is over with Cap Friendly, this is the way it's going to look. Now that line is enormous. 6'8", 246 Soderblom. Rasmussen, 6'6", 221. And Oscar Sundquist is no slouch himself. And I love Oscar Sundquist. He is, I think, one of the, one of the more underrated players in the league, to tell you the honest truth. He's solid. He's quick. He's good defensively. He's good. All, all areas of the ice, he can score. And if Michael Rasmussen, you know, these big body guys take a while to get going. If he gets it going this year, this line could be extremely good. As it stands, it's an okay third line with a good chance to be a very good one. And then the fourth line of Kubelik, Suter, and Erne. I'm a little concerned that Kubelik doesn't get higher in the lineup here. He's not a defensive guy, really, at all. Um, it's To me, he's kind of a guy that if he can't play in your top six, I don't know really if he's that much value. Um, 
Pia Suter is a great two-way guy. I don't mind him anywhere in the lineup, to tell you the honest truth. He can play all different spots. It's okay to have him in the bottom line with Adam Erne. It's it's not a terrible fourth line, but it's not super great. But overall, the top 12, I think, are solid. My problem, and I think I'm going to get a lot of people that disagree with me here, is I don't think their defense has improved as much as people think. Ben Chirot might be the most, one of the most, the most or close to the most overrated defenseman in the league. He is, he is uh, trumpeted as a shutdown defenseman. But analytically, he is, uh, he is not good defensively. He's actually better offensively than he is defensively. I've mentioned this several times before, uh, uh, and and with other videos I've done here, that Ben Chara puts himself out of position too much. He he tries to be he's over aggressive, and it's great for the eye test. People that watch Ben Chara they love him because he overcommits in corners and then comes back and blocks shots when he blocks them. But when he does, he looks amazing doing it, and people think, oh, what a great defensive defenseman. But it's not. The, 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 uh, the goal is to not have to block shots. With Ben Chirot, it seems to be the plan to block shots. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Now, that being said, it's like, Stevie Eisenman's brilliant. I'm going to trust him over you, Perlo. I got you. Totally get you there. Because he's brilliant, this is my take, Okay. I think they brought in Ben Chirot because Ben Chirot's a great skater for his size, which is huge. He has all the tools and has his whole career to be a fantastic defenseman. I think he came in, and he's going to be surprised to find out that what they're going to tell him is, watch Moritz Sider. <clears throat> we want you to play like Moritz, can, if you can figure that out. And people are thinking they brought Ben Chirot in to help Maurice Sider. I don't think so. I think it's the other way around. Because if Ben Chirot played more like Maurice Sider, he would be a much better defenseman. Maurice Sider is way beyond what Ben Chirot has ever been in his career. There is really not much he can learn from them. Uh, him. So he's better at him at just about everything. What's he going to learn from Ben Chirot? How to be physically stronger, I guess? I don't know. Tell me in the comment section what you think about that. Ole Mata had a pretty decent year defensively last year. He's had serious injury problems. Uh, I don't mind the pickup at 2.2. It's okay. Uh, but and, he, and and maybe in this case that makes the, def him, it be, uh, the defense a little better than last year. Uh, but not spectacularly so. Philip Peronic is going to have another year older. He's pretty much an offensive guy. Maybe only Olimata is going to help him be able to be more so comfortable being offensive because he's not all that great defensively. And Robert Hag and Gustav Lindstrom. Robert Hag is oh, is whatever. He's a good penalty killer guy. That's about it. Another guy who spends way too much time in his own zone. Uh Block shots like crazy because he has to. And uh, that'll give Gustav Lindstrom this idea that I can move on to the offense because Robert Hag will play, will block shots down in the defensive zone. That's kind of the deal. Honestly, I think all of those guys are overrated. And I really don't think that they have improved their defense that much here. I do believe the Moritz Sider is going to be better, Heronic is going to be better, and Lindstrom is going to be better. So in that way, they may be better on defense because of that, but not really as much because of their ads that they added into their lineup. Ville Husso uh, in goal, one good year, man. Again, I'm trusting Stevie Y here that this guy is ready to be a number one. He's an older guy that is that took a while to, uh, to. He went through all the levels, 
and he took a while to get get his footing in the NHL, and he came on kind of in gangbusters, and now he's got a really good chance to steal a number one spot. I've mentioned it a million times. I'm not a huge Nedeljkovic fan. He's okay as a 1B, but I don't think he's a number one at all. He's great athletically, but he's not. Overall, I, I, I just, over even when he was in Carolina, he pulled those numbers but he pulled those numbers not looking that great doing it. I, I don't know how to explain it, but they're just such a good two-way team. They make goaltenders look good. Um, so that, I like the replacement players. Joseph Alino there. He should be ready for third-line duty soon. Uh, hopefully, Philip Sedina can turn it around. And they got guys coming back like Fabry. Uh, you know, Pissick and Wallman will come in and add depth to this lineup. So for injury's sake, they're not bad off. And I think offensively, they could push themselves into a playoff spot because in the regular season, offense wins. And they could do it. Tell me what you think about that Detroit Red Wings fans. But I am going to say Buffalo makes their first playoff appearance in, what, 10 years? And this is weird because I'm you're – I said it's really close. Like when you're talking about splitting hairs, like I said with Buffalo, with uh, like with uh, Ottawa, Boston, Detroit, and Buffalo, I really mean it. Any one of these teams can make a push. The other thing I wanted to say about Detroit and with Buffalo, Detroit has some cap space. Buffalo has a lot of cap space, like 13, 14 million. And they were making some big strides last year. I think Everson is, or not Everson, uh, Granado is a fantastic coach. And, uh, and a lot of their players are reaching that step up point in their careers. Like Dylan Cousins, I just think he's going to have a big year. Uh, Paterka is going to have a strong year, I think, this year, his first year in the NHL. Peyton Krebs is time to step up. He's, he, you know, he's slowly building himself up into a solid player. Jack Quinn looked fantastic in the early stages last year before he got injured. Casey Middlestat looked way better than he ever has, and he might make a big jump here. Alex Tuck, Tage Thompson had a monster year. Can he recreate that? And same as Jeff Skinner. I think overall the offense has a chance to be a lot better than last year. and But the real reason why I'm putting them in a playoff spot here is I think this defense is way underrated. Matthias Samuelson at 22 years old looks like a 27-year-old. This guy, to me, is one of, if not the most underrated defensemen in the league. Rasmus Dahlin is set to have a monster, monster year this year. With a full year and a half with Granado, this guy, when he came into the league, looked like he was going to crush everyone. And I think this year, he can do that. Owen Power, to me, I normally would say, hey, he's 19 years old. Don't put too much pressure on this kid. But every time I saw that guy on the ice, I was like, wow. That big, with that size, the ability to shoot the way he does. He's, his positional play for a 19-year-old is insane. Insane. Much like I was already talking about with Moritz Sider. You know, I see that in Owen Power. Jacob Bryson, this underrated two-way guy, love the pickup of Lia Bushkin. Doesn't get enough credit for how good he is at both ends of the ice. Enrique Okiharu is sort of the weak link here at 24 years old. He's an offensive guy that doesn't put up much offense, and he's defensively he's a little laxed. But... This team has the cap space to fill these holes. And we can't go on without talking about Eric Comrie, the pickup from Winnipeg. I don't know what it is. This is just a take on me. I've loved this guy for a while, and I've wondered why he hasn't been able to get his footing somewhere. From what I understand, what I think is Eric Comrie is a guy who doesn't take life all that seriously. And I think he's rubbed some coaches the wrong way because of that along the way. And 
Buffalo, on the other hand, they're looking to kind of change the culture of seriousness in the locker room. I, I think this has been an over-serious team for quite some time. If you ever see Eichel, he doesn't smile very often. He gives me an impression of that. And they've been wanting to, uh, you know, and that's been the heart of this team for a while. And I believe they've been wanting to lighten up this room, this roster for a while, and have a much more positive kind of light feeling, have fun playing, but still being very competitive at the same time. Granado gives me the impression as being that type of coach as well. I could be wrong here. We'll see. But I just have a feeling Eric Comrie's going to have a stellar year this year. I just have that feeling. Um, and if that's the case with this defense and, you know, a very underrated offensive court, I think this team can make the playoffs. Just and, and that's the big thing, too. Granado is the type of coach that can get teams that really shouldn't make the playoffs into it. Like Barry Trotz, like Tortorella, like Sullivan in Pittsburgh, like, you know, these elite coaches. I think he's an elite coach. I should have mentioned in Detroit, I'm not so sure about Lalon. He could be too, in which case, there you go. I mean, Detroit could make the playoffs easy. Any one of these teams could. I'm just slightly putting Buffalo in. Uh, that's basically how I'm looking at it. Tell me what you think, Buffalo Sabres fans. What do you think about your team making the playoffs? Do you agree with me? I know I've talked to a bunch of Buffalo fans, and I've heard actual Buffalo fans say that they don't think that they're going to make the playoffs this year. But another big thing about making the playoffs to me is what a team has to replace injuries on their roster. And I like the way Brett Murray played last year. I like Brandon Biro to step into the roster if need be. I didn't even mention their new captain, Kyle Pozo, who also can add into that lineup as well. Um, Sean Malone. You know, they got a... Isaac Rosen is a young kid who might get a shot up here. They got a lot of guys. They would have to have a really good pileup of injuries for them to fall apart here. Uh, on defense, like most teams, maybe not so much. Kale Clay can play. He's played in the league several uh, quite a bit. Uh, Chase Prixey and Jeremy Davies have played in the league. They have NHL experience. They can fill holes. I don't mind it. It's not spectacular, but it might be good enough. Okay, tell me what you think, Buffalo Sabres fans. Comment in the comment section. Let me know. By the way, for all of you out there in the middle of my video here, I'm also a professional sports handicapper. Uh, people pay me for sports picks, and I get them right a lot, and they make money. If you like to do that sort of thing, I'll leave a link in the bottom for bpalpicks.com. You can go in there and check it out. Have some fun with me doing picks and making money. Next, Florida Panthers. I have third. The reason why I have the Florida Panthers third is probably not the same reason as a lot of people. When they won the Presidents last year, a lot of people are saying that they're going to take a loss because of the trade for Matthew Kachuk, where they lost the trade because they lost Huberto and Uyghur. I'm not, that's not actually the reason. I think the reason why I'm putting them third is they this team is going to learn with Paul Maurice as their new coach that it is imperative that you pace yourself throughout the year. They didn't do that last year. They wanted to win every game. They wanted to win the first president's trophy for the organization. It's great for the fan base. Uh, it's something super positive that they needed, I think, to sell tickets and all kinds of stuff bring fans into the arena. But nothing does that more than winning in the playoffs. And if you're going to really win in the playoffs, if you ever see with Tampa Bay, you'll see with Colorado this year, Pittsburgh Penguins do this. They pace themselves. There's some games where they look, they just kind of play perimeter. They've already got themselves ahead in the standings. They don't want to get injured. They want to make sure that they're not throwing it all out there in the regular season with nothing left in the playoffs. 
I think you're going to see that more here with a veteran coach like Paul Maurice. As far as the lineup is concerned, I still absolutely love this lineup. Verhege, Barkoff, and Reinhardt, if that's the way they keep it. Um, I was hoping that Kachuk would be playing with Barkoff because that would be amazing, but I understand why not because both Barkoff and Reinhardt are fantastic defensively. I mean, that's understating it with Barkoff. He's insanely good two-way player, insanely elite, no doubt about it. Carter Verhege in there. That's a great shutdown line and scoring line all at the same time. They can hurt you every single way. Um, I love the line. Kachuk, Bennett, and Balsers. This pickup of Balsers, when it happened, I couldn't believe they got Balsers at 750000 I couldn't freaking believe it. Where was the rest of the league here? Are you kidding me? You guys are going to absolutely love this guy. And look at them putting him on the second line with Bennett and Kachuk. This is going to be a great line, my friends. Fantastic. Balsers is an excellent two-way winger. Bennett, he's pretty good two-way. He's a good, great shooter. Matthew Kachuk is the most underrated winger, two-way winger in the league. He should be getting Selkie consideration. He can beat you every way. The compete level on this guy is absolutely gonzo. He's a team guy. He's a fighter. He's defensively sound. He's an amazing shooter. The guy is a unicorn of a player, and I totally understand why they didn't give Huberto at 29 years old his $10 million a year when they could give it to a 24-year-old Kachuk. I love Huberto for his passing. His offense is great. But defensively, he wasn't very good. And this was a team that needed to learn to be amazing two-way player, like Colorado, two-way team. Colorado, top 12, man-to-man man man are great two-way players. And that's what win cups in the new, new NHL, I believe. So you're seeing that here. I love it. And that, and then Anton Lundell is your third-line center. Anton Liddell probably, like Barkov, has a Selkie in his future. This guy is almost like the second coming of Barkov. Two Barkovs in your freaking lineup, my friends. Insane talent. Insane amount of talent in the bottom of their lineup. And he's only 21 years old. Etu Lusterainen, also extremely underrated. Love this guy. You've got a general manager in Zito who is an incredible analytics guy that knows how to pluck guys out left, right, and center. Colin White on the right was, at one time, was, an incre- was a really solid two-way guy. He got some injuries, and I don't know what happened. We'll see what happens in Florida. But if he can get that back... That line is a second line on almost every team in the league and a damn good one at that. And then your fourth line, you got the spiritual leader in Hornquist. Nick Cousins is a great two-way center, like great in the sense for what he does. Good defensive player, good two-way forward. Ryan Lomberg isn't bad in that regard as well. I love that fourth line. Absolutely love it. Now we'll get to the part where things get a little sketchy. We lost Uyghur. That hurts. That definitely hurts. Forsling probably shouldn't be a top pairing guy playing with Ekblad. Mark Stahl should definitely not be in your top four. There's no doubt about that. And I honestly don't think he will be. Because I've really liked Matt Kierstadt for quite some time. And he's come in and stole a spot here. And I think he's going to just continue growing as a player. I think they've known that for a while. And that's the reason they thought they could leave, let Weger go. So I see Kirsat taking that spot with Montour on the right side. Which is meh. Okay. Stahl and Gudas in the bottom pairing. Not great. But trades can happen throughout the year. You make some cap space. You could trade somebody like Sam Bennett. I know that's tough to say because he's friends with Kachuk. 
for some defense or something like that. But they're so stacked up the middle they could get away with a deal like that. And then Bob Roski and Knight. I don't know what's going to happen with Bob Roski. I don't know. Is he going to keep what he is right now? He's overpaid, no doubt. Hopefully at least he can be what he was last year. But we got to remember the team last year did not play well defensively all year in the regular season. And he was kind of left out to dry quite a bit. So that could totally change here. And Bobrovsky could be amazing. That being said, I don't know if they even think that because they gave Spencer Knight three years at what, four and a half million or something like that, or almost five. I don't know how that's going to play out. I love Spencer Knight. Uh, I think he's going to be amazing. Uh, from what I understand, they really thought that somebody was going to give him a qualifying or like an offer next year, offer sheet him. That's the reason why they gave they got went in so high because they didn't want to lose him, especially if Bobrovsky can't get anywhere near to what he used to be. So I kind of get it that way. As far as replacement players are concerned, Zach Dalpy is always wonderful to play in your fourth line every once in a while throughout the year. He's a hard-working guy. Uh, not a guy you always want in your lineup. Chris Tierney has played plenty in his career. He can definitely fill the role. Gerald Mayhew with his big shot and speed. They did well to be able to get replacement players here. Dennis Anko's supposed to. I don't know what's going to happen with that guy. Connor Bunnerman has played lots of depth. They did a really good job of getting guys that can definitely play for the forward. I was surprised Lucas Carlson didn't make it. Um, but he can definitely come in and, and, and fill a role. Michael Delzato's got tons of experience. Anthony Batetto can play if you need him. Not bad depth on D. In fact, all through the league, though, defensive depth is a, is a struggle. All through the league. This is actually some of the better defensive depth in the league. All right. Injuries happen. I don't know much about either one of these goaltenders, to tell you the honest truth. Uh, what have we got? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I forgot. They just picked up Josh Mahura for D2. This guy should be way better than he is. I don't know what happened in Anaheim. He wasn't able to get there. Florida seems to be really good at p plucking these guys, and all of a sudden they turn around and they're fantastic. By the way, if Jonathan Duclair does happen to come back, to the Achilles, then you're even looking at a deeper team offensively. So their defense, to me, is weak. Like everybody, a lot of people think when they're losing, Uyghur was big. I just think that for sure up until the playoffs, the overall depth and two-way play of their forwards will easily be able to make up for that. And they'll, you know, they're going to pace themselves a little bit. They end up being third overall but having a much better playoffs than last year. That's my take. Panthers fans or anybody else out there, if you disagree with me, comment in the comment section, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and let me know. Tampa. Okay, I did a little thing with uh, Peyton on the radio, and I had Tampa first in this division at first. But I've changed my mind. And... The reason why I have changed my mind, uh, I'll get into it first, that, okay, Tampa is one of those teams that usually paces themselves throughout the year, as I already mentioned with Florida before this. But this year, I don't think they, there's a feeling that they have the, uh, the luxury of doing that. I have a feeling this team's going to have to fight a lot harder this year and get a lot more ahead and try to hold on to it more. They're going to be fighting a lot more in the regular season this year than they're used to. I do believe that. I do believe that. So, the question is going to be, will they be, will they be third or will they be second? I'm going to put them second because I just think they're going to fight harder. I was going to put them first for that very reason. Losing Palat um, and losing McDonough, it's got to be a little uneasy for this room. Those are big guys to lose. 
the replacement guys, like especially when Cole had his issue with the uh, sexual assault or whatever the case may be, could cause some difficulties here as well. But Philip Myers and Hayden Flurry just aren't, you know, they're only okay. Philip Myers was sent down until Cole came, was brought back up again. He struggled for the last two years. Hayden Fleury has struggled to make a lineup too. All of a sudden, their top six isn't as solid as it was. Their top four is fantastic. Chernock, Sergachev, Foot hadn't been beautiful. Injuries happen. Things are a little bit tough. But because of that, I think this team's going to have to fight a little bit more. They're, they're, they're not going to be able to pace themselves like they normally do out through, through the season. In which case, I think they're going to fight a little harder to get higher in the standings than normal. I know. I, tell me if that sounds weird to you, but uh, it's uh, it's something I've noticed with the Tampa Bay Lightning and the league in general the last like five or six years. But Stamkos, Point, Kucherov. Hey, Stamkos had a career year last year. No reason for me to think it's not going to keep going. Point. I think, I don't know, he had some injuries and he's got to get her back again, but they're giving him the opportunity to do that by putting him with two of the best players in the league. So I think he'll be fine. Kalorn, Paul, and Hagel, I don't know. I'm not sure that second line doesn't blow you out of the water. Like it's it's good, if but not like what we're used to, right? It's not like what we're used to. And then Kopke getting a chance. I think that. Tell me if Kopka or Kopke. Not even really. Came out of the blue and made the roster with Nemeshnikov and, and, and Ross Colton. I thought Ross Colton would play higher in the lineup, to tell you the honest truth. Um, but they're trying him here on the right side because they need somebody to fill that right side third, third line role. I got to see how this lineup is going to turn out. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, but Maroon, Bellamar, and Perry is a, is a fantastic fourth line. I still think this lineup is going to be solid. I just think they're going to have to try a lot harder than they have had to for quite some time in the regular season. And Vasilevsky, of course, is just still a beast. Maybe he gets another Vesna this year because the uh, optics is will be that they lost a few players and if they make the playoffs really well and his numbers are fantastic, it's safe to give Vasilevsky like uh, a Vesna based on the fact that this team wasn't nece- was supposed to take a fallback. Okay, so I could see Vasilevsky winning the Vesna again this year. Once Anthony Sorelli comes back and it sounds like it's gonna be a while of course, that roster gets even better than it was before. Um, as far as replacement players are concerned, Alex Barboule, he's good, man. He can play in that bottom pairing, no doubt about it. Gemmel Smith is okay. Things could get rough, and you could see Tampa Bay take a nosedive heavy if injuries pile up here. You really could. Really could. It's kind of scary, actually. Um, I'm wondering if I put them maybe higher than I should have to tell you the honest truth as I'm doing this video, but I'm going to keep them there. They have too much of a track record. Uh, they know how to win. They have too many players out there. Their system is fantastic. They have an underrated coach. Maybe Cooper gets his coach of the year. Finally, maybe that's what happens here. That would be interesting. That would be cool. Actually. Tell me what you think Tampa Bay fans. How do you like this? The replacement players from uh, losing McDonough and losing Pawad. Do you think they're gonna? There's gonna be a serious fallback here, or is are they just gonna keep on rolling? And finally, the Toronto Maple Leafs. I'm putting them number one. I'm putting them number one in this division, mostly because. Offense wins in the regular season, and they've got crap loads of it still. Matthew, 60, 70 goals or whatever he's going to get. Uh, Mitchell Marner, one of the best playmakers in the league along with them. 
Nylander, Tavares, we all know the guys. I mean, Tavares, people poop on him, but he still gets a point of game out there, guys. Come on, right? Um, Kerfoot in the bottom, in the third, on the third line with Yarncroft and Engvall is a really good two-way line. And I love the fourth line. I love the pickup of Aston Reese. He's one of the best, better defensive player de forwards in the league. Perfect guy. With Kopp and Obe Kubel, who also does pretty good both ways. I like it. Really like their lineup. Unbelievable Dennis Mulgan makes the team again. I think this is a work ethic thing. Dennis Mulgan, I guess, is just will outwork everybody all the time. And I think they're trying to give a lesson to guys like Nicholas Robertson and Adam Goudet, who aren't known for that, that you might be better skill-wise, but we need you to work harder. We just need you to work harder. You're not going to make it until you start committing and working hard every day. We want you to be like Mulgan. If you do that with your skill level, you'll be amazing, especially Adam Godet. Like, he's got all of it, man, all of it. He just hasn't got the commitment level needed to be in the NHL. I do believe that's what it is. So, and defense, so underrated. Riley and TJ Brody are great to top two. Jake Muzzin, if he's healthy, is fantastic. Justin Hull, not so much, but... Okay, he's a guy. Giordano still can do it. And Rasmus Sandin, Sandin on the right, right side as a lefty. We'll see how that turns out until Timothy Lilligren comes back, who I love, love, love. I, I, I don't mind their top six. I don't mind their defense really at all. The big question mark is going to be Matt Murray and Ilya Samsonov. I don't pay attention to preseason except for goaltenders. And both of them have looked good. Matt Murray has looked really, really, really good. I actually like Dubas. A lot of people don't like Dubas. I think what he did, I'm not, I wasn't really a fan of the Tavares move. I'll be the first to admit that. He had his reasons, though. And he had a plan before COVID came in that he believed he'd be able to get enough. You know, The depth would have been a lot better if the cap didn't go the way it did. Nobody got hurt by the cap more than Toronto did. He went out and got the players he believed were going to win cups. And he did so, and he signed players, made them happy right away so they don't take off out of Canada, like Austin Matthews paying them $11 million. I, I mean, Mitch Marner got $11 million in his first contract. Do you think he's not going to stick around with this team? Right? You see it with other teams out there that chintz these guys early, give them uh, bridge contracts, and then it comes to the time where they have an option to sign a long-term contract before they become a free agent. They're like, nah, that's all right. If you would have believed in me three years ago, maybe. But now, nah. There's value in, in signing these guys like this. They're going to stay with your organization, and I think they will. And I'm going to trust them on Matt Murray. I was like everybody out there when they said, Matt Murray, the guy has been garbage for three years. Really? And Sam Sonoff was hot ass last year. He was absolutely terrible. If that stays going here, of course, this is off the table. This is going to be a disaster. But I just have a feeling he's, his, this staff and he might have caught something here with Matt Murray. I, I just have that feeling that they saw something snap in Murray that brought him back to his old Pittsburgh days. And you know what? I kind of did too. When he came back from his last injury, he didn't seem to have that arrogance that he had before. I think this was a kid whose head got a little too big for him. And something about that injury made him realize, you know what, okay, if I, I'm, I, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am here. Maybe I got to get back to what I was and do the things I did when I was great in Pittsburgh. 
Maybe maybe my head just got a little too big for my I got a little too big for my britches here. And I think maybe they saw that and this they could have nailed it. If they did nail this, this might be my team to win the cup this year, believe it or not. That's right. Not only win one round, but win the cup. All right. That's my full 42, boys and girls. That's all I got to give to you today. Remember, bpalpicks.com. Here I am. Look at the shadowy. I'm in my cabin here. <laughs> don't have very good lighting, but what do we need good lighting for, right? We don't need anything. All we need is good hockey talk at bpalpicks. Go to bpalpicks.com. Make some money. Hitting NHL picks all over the place. All sports, actually. Okay, bye.